It's Lars, and thanks, thanks to you all for coming to hear my talk today. Um, for me, this is a lot of fun because I was a student here. I graduated in 2002 with my PhD from the physics program. And this guy here, Mark Shrednicki, who's going to celebrate his retirement, was my thesis advisor. And so it's so much fun to be back here, a uh, part of this program, kind of my, my home. So when I came here the other day, uh, I walked into the uh, courtyard outside and I asked some of the people, are you here for my program? Are you here for quantum metrology? And the person I asked said, I don't know what those two words mean when you join them together. Uh, and so my talk is geared for that person and for those of you maybe in that same camp. What is quantum metrology? That's what our program is all about. And so I hope by the time that you finish your lunch, you at least have some basic grounding in some of the uh, core ideas of the field, some of the accomplishments that have been made in this area, and some of the directions we're trying to pursue the title of the program is New Directions in Quantum Metrology. So quantum metrology has been around for a while. The outline of my talk, by the way, is given right up here. So uh, my name is Andrew Jordan. I'm currently at Chapman University, just south of here in Orange County. I was for 15 years at the University of Rochester, and I was so addicted to the Southern California climate, I couldn't stay away, so I moved back uh, here. Um, I'll begin with some classical concepts in metrology. How do I begin to process information, make measurements? What does this mean? I'll talk about quantum generalizations. What is the standard quantum limit? And then talk about some advantages. So the core idea of quantum metrology is that we're using quantum mechanics as a new kind of physics in order to gain some kind of metrological advantage. And I'll talk about what that means a little bit further down the line. And then going beyond that metrological advantage, so thinking about there's a certain kind of phenomenon called Heisenberg scaling. I'll talk about how to exceed that. And then maybe some of the most impactful in terms of benefit to society that I think we've made is by working really, really hard to discover quantum advantages. We've uncovered classical metrological advantages people have overlooked. And I think maybe those discoveries are maybe even more important to society than the quantum metrology. But we'll, 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 well, that's sort of an open question. And then I'll conclude. So let me begin. So what is, uh, first of all, what is quantum? So you all know the quantum mechanics is the physics of the atom and many other things. So we learn it. Mark Shrednick, he taught that, taught that to me <coughs> as a graduate student. What is metrology? So metrology is a scientific study of measurement, especially the standardization and definition of units of measurement. So we have a whole institute here in our country, NIST, the National Institute uh, standards, which is all about trying to define these units, so that's what they do as their full-time job. And so we, in quantum metrology, we're trying to take those definitions of standards and, and the ultimate limits of precision and push them even further. Okay. So what's interesting is that this is part and parcel of quantum measurement theory. So when you learn about quantum mecha mechanics, you learned about the measurement postulates and how to describe, we take the wave functions, we do measurements, and we get results and we can predict the probabilities of those results. What's interesting is that I just finished writing a 300 page book on the physics of quantum measurement. So this will, I just got the page proofs back from Cambridge University Press. So this should be published by the end of the year. But what's interesting in these 300 pages about quantum measurement, I only very briefly touched on quantum metrology. So, so even though it's related, it's really a distinct field of this area uh, with only a brief discussion. So what are the basic ingredients that go into this field? So first of all, we have to talk about what we want to measure. We define the thing we're interested in. Are we interested in a magnetic field? Are we interested in an optical beam deflection, an optical phase, a gravitational constant, trying to detect dark matter? Whatever you want to find, we have to decide, decide what we're interested in, what we want to measure. Then we describe how we're going to measure it, what kind of physical apparatus do we bring in to do that measurement, and then how do we process the data and then find the best precision and accuracy on the parameters that we want to do. So here are some of the applications of this field. 
We were just talking last week with the high energy particle physics. Hi, David. Welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, we were talking about the high energy particle physics, and when they talk about applications for them, they're like, oh, great, we're going to use uh, your stuff to detect dark matter, or we're going to detect it to do G minus 2, or something like that. And that's great, although usually in our field, we're not thinking about those kind of applications. We're thinking about maybe more practical applications, like inertial navigation. If you can build the world's most sensitive gyroscope, you don't need GPS to navigate. We can simply use the gyroscope to be able to do that. And so there's all kinds of efforts to try to build very precise gyroscopes. Gravimetry, if you can build the world's most precise gravimeter, you can discover oil deposits or diamond mines or what have you. If you're doing remote sensing, if you're thinking about LIDAR or radar or, or any of these applications used for everything from the military to our cars now, being able to do better remote sensing is extremely important. Maybe one of the oldest and most important applications of quantum technology for metrology is in clocks. So our atomic clocks set our definition of the second. So this is extremely important. We have a number of experts in, in atomic clocks that are here as part of our program. And then also things like optical resolutions. So we're set by the Rayleigh limit in optical diffraction theory. Can we beat that? It turns out that we can beat that in some cir circumstances. So these are some of the applications that we want to bring this formal approach to be able to solve these problems that are, that are uh, important for our society. Okay, good. So I'm going to give, uh, so let me begin um, with this topic about, good. Let's start with classical concepts in metrology. So we're going to begin with the very simplest case. Suppose I throw a coin or I toss a dice and this is not a fair coin or a fair dice, but it's weighted in some way, uh, how can I optimally find the weight of a coin? Okay. And so this, this basic problem involves uh, a physical process, throwing the coin, say, in number of times. It involves a resource, the number of times I throw the coin. It involves the data I get, the heads, number of heads versus tails. And it involves some kind of processing of that data. I take that information and then I construct that into an estimate of the weighting of the coin. So all those elements I just mentioned are an all metrological process. They all share that in common. And what's the goal? So the goal is that there is a parameter We'll call it G. I want to measure. And we'll say it has a true value. And I want to estimate that true value from the data that I acquire. And so I say that, that I, I create an estimate. I'll put a little hat on that to not denote an operator, but an estimate. And I say the estimate is the true value plus some uncertainties. So there is some accuracy. And there is some precision, notion of precision. OK? And so this is affected, the, the deviation from the true value. So this is, this, this is affected by systematic errors, or systematic noise. Whereas the precision is the statistical error in the measure. Okay, and so typically in quantum metrology, we usually focus on the latter, although often in realistic applications like atomic clocks, they're limited by the former. Okay, and so this is maybe something we've talked about, about trying to do work more on this, but then you have to know a lot about the details of the system to do this. Okay. All right, so let me give you a very simple example. So we'll take a Gaussian process. So we have some continuous variable x. And there is some Gaussian distribution on that x. And if this is my origin, 
I imagine the mean is a little bit different from the origin. I didn't draw it very well. We'll call it G. And so we want to estimate the mean. And the reason I'm giving this very simple example is just so you see all of the ingredients that are common to all metrological uh, problems. And so if I write this distribution, P of x is proportional to the exponential x minus g squared over 2 sigma squared, where sigma is the, is the uncertainty. What we're going to do is we're going to sample the distribution n times. And so I get some collection of data, xi, where i goes from 1 to n. So we say n is the metrological resource. It's the number of times I sample the, the distribution. How can I estimate g? Now, I hope you all know how to do that. What you would do is you would simply take all the data and add them from 1 to n and divide by n. Okay, so we learned that in, 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 in uh, elementary uh, university classes. And we call this an estimator of g. And this quantity here is called a statistic. So it's some combination of the data we gather that we combine in some certain arithmetic way to be able to estimate the, the parameter g. And of course, there are many ways of doing this. This is not a unique way. This is just turns out to be the best way. But there are many possible combinations of estimating this. And so one of the results from classical metrology theory is to figure out what's the best way to construct the estimator to get the best uncertainty about the parameter of g. Now, if I calculate the average of this estimator with my distribution p, it's easy to work out. This is just the true value of the parameter g. Okay, so if this is true, we call this an unbiased estimator. And most of the results in statistics rely on this unbiased estimation. Things get much more complicated if you don't have an unbiased estimator. But what you want is you say, for example, what's the precision of the measurement? What we're going to do is we're going to calculate the variance of the true value squared. And this will then set the uncertainty of the measurement. So if I calculate this variance, I'll write that as the variance of g hat. And I write that as, I can just write it down. I take this squared, sum over i and j, xi x minus g, xj minus g, like so. Because these are uncorrelated, this becomes a delta function uh, of, the, of the events. And so when I work this out, then I get the following. I just get sigma squared over n. Okay? And so this is telling us that the more information or the more measurements I take, the more I average, the variance is going down like 1 over n. And so this is good. And so then my uncertainty, my, my, my precision uncertainty of g is like the square root of that. So it's like sigma over square root of n. So you've all probably seen this before. The, for uncorrelated measurements, the uncertainty goes down like 1 over square root of n. Okay? And there's now an important question we can ask. What is the best statistic we can take? And so to answer this question, we're going to introduce some concepts introduced by Fisher, not, not Matthew Fisher, who is, again, one of my former professors here. He's back there in the back. Not Judas Fisher, another Fisher. His ancestor, 1922. Kramer. Wow, these are in the 1940s. What did they do? Well, they, they, they answered this question in a very elegant way. They said, given some probability distribution of random events, my model is I have some p that depends on g uh, as a function of my random variable x. 
the question is, find this best statistic. And so what they did is they said, well, first we're going to introduce something called the score. And it's the derivative with respect to the parameter of the logarithm of p of g. So this is the score. And if you calculate the average of the score, so if I take the average of that quantity, integrate dx, pg of x, it's very easy to show in a line or two of mathematics that it's zero. Okay? So something that on average is zero, well then they said, let's go to the next moment, let's look at the, that quantity squared. And this defines the Fisher information. So I'm going to call it f. It's the function of the parameter I want to estimate. It's the integration over, over the variable x. It, it's, I think in continuous variables, it's easy to write discrete versions of this. pg of x. And then I take the derivative with respect to g of the logarithm pg of x squared, and that defines the Fisher information. So what does this mean? This is a mathematical formula. This is a measure of essentially how the distribution is sensitive to small changes of the parameter I'm interested in. Okay, so as we get to zero in on that region, this quantifies that. And so this is a, then a measure of that sensitivity. And why is it important? So I'll use this in a moment. I can also write this if p is a regular with analytic distribution. I can write this also in the following way. I can write it in terms of the second derivative, log pg of x, like so. So why is it important? So Kramer and Rao proved a very nice bound. And what they said is take any estimator you want. G hat. So up here, and then my simple example, I have this sum over x, write it over n, but now I can take it to be anything. And what they proved is that if I take the variance of this estimator, it's bounded uh, by a value like this, like so. So n is the number of samples, uh, uh, number of samples of the distribution, or samplings of the distribution. And so what's powerful about this is it says, uh, no matter what you do, there is, a, there is a lower bound you can get to. You want to make this as small as possible. And so if I'm able to then saturate this bound, that's the best possible estimator I can give, I can write down, given, given that metrological constraint. Okay? And so in principle, what we want to do is we want to make Fisher information as big as possible to make this variance as small as possible. Okay? And it turns out that if you have a large number of measurements, if n is large, uh, then there's a way of doing that that saturates this bound for single parameter estimation. It's called maximum likelihood estimation. You probably have heard of that before. I'm not going to go through it now, but there's a way of constructing an estimator that then saturates that bound. So let's look at our little example for the Gaussians to figure that out. So for the Gaussian example, if I calculate the integration, the second derivative log pg of x that goes into, say, this formula here, this part of this formula, then we see if I can work that out very simple, and simply, the logarithm that depends on g gets rid of the exponential. I take two derivatives back to g, and gets rid of the g, and so it's just one over sigma squared. So when I integrate the, over this, the, this gives an integral of one. So this tells me my Fisher information Uh, is 1 over sigma squared. And if I do that, if I sample it n times, I get a factor of n because the Fisher information adds for independent events. And so that tells me the variance of g must be bigger than or equal to sigma squared over n. 
And so that tells me that the simple thing I wrote down, the averaging over all n, dividing by n, that was the best thing to do. So then here it's obvious, but very often if you have a more complicated distribution, it's not at all obvious. And so then this gives you the hint of how to, how to be able to construct these estimators to get the best possible variance. Okay. All right, I'm going to go to the quantum now, but before I do that, it's my professorial duty to ask you if you have any questions at this point. Mark. Does this depend on how G is parameterized? Suppose I declare I want G squared instead of G. That's a good question. That's a good question. And, and so if you change the parameterization, then there are like chain rules for how the Fisher information changes as well. And so... Uh, you, you, you reach the same conclusion. So typically, you would, if, if g was a some function of some other parameter, nu, right, something like that, then I can write, and these are both deterministic parameters, right? I can write something like d, g, d nu, d nu. So this gives a slope. So this is actually very important because, for example, uh, if, this, if this is something that, that I can easily measure, but it depends in a very sensitive way on nu. Suppose nu is a frequency I want to measure, and this has a very steep slope, then this is good for me, because then it says, even if I have a relatively coarse in, uh, estimation of g, I can get a good estimation on nu. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Oh, yes, in the back. Yeah, it's a good question. So Shannon Entropy tells you about the sort of a, a amount of surprisal or the amount of um, uh, in, in information entropy in, in, the, in the distribution. So, so, so the information here is a very, in a very specific sense. It tells you how sensitive the distribution is to a parameter. So that, that, that notion is not caught in Shannon information. But in fact, we just were having a discussion about this last week. Who was there with my discussion about it? Uh, Mark, what, what did we conclude? Did we have a conclusion? Great. Thank you for answering my question. Now we're going to bring in quantum. So, so far everything is classical. So we have an atom now. So this is going to be our, our physical system we're considering. And it could be, of course, any of the quantum generalizations of the atom. And what's our problem? Well, typically, so as we have standard quantum mechanics, we have the Schrodinger equation and its generalizations together with usual measurement theory. And we want to estimate a Hamiltonian parameter, usually. OK. So for example, we're going to estimate the Bohr radius or some frequency difference. So if we suppose we want to estimate the frequency difference between two hyperfine states of cesium-133. We'll get this number. That's not a made-up number. That's, in fact, the definition of the second that was set back in the 1960s. Okay, that was the state of the art in the 1960s. So just for fun today, people here that are experts in this will tell you what's the best, current best accuracy. Not, not in cesium, but in any atomic clock. What they do is they write it in terms of relative frequency. Accuracy of the frequency divided by the total frequency, and they're now at 10 to the minus 16. Okay? So if you look at this, this is 3, 6, 9. That was, that's basically 10 to, the, 10 to the 9, minus 9, right? We're already many orders of magnitude better than that today. Okay? So in other words, let's put that in context. This loses one second, the clock, every 300 billion years. Okay, so crazy levels of accuracy for this. 
All right, so, this, so those are the kinds of things we want to estimate. And now what's the basic paradigm of quantum metrology? So the simplest thing that I'll teach you about today, and of course there are more complicated things to do, is I have my quantum systems and a bunch of them prepared in some quantum state, psi, psi, and we'll call this, I say psi 1, psi 1 to psi n. And now we're going to let that, those systems evolve under interaction with some unitary dynamics, or it could be, in the, in the simplest case, there's some unitary process, and the unitary process depends upon the parameter we want to estimate. So for example, if the parameter is in the Hamiltonian, that will then imprint that information on the quantum systems undergoing some evolution. So if there are n of these states, that's like my parallel resource. I wait some time t, that's my serial resource. And then I do a bunch of measurements at the end, and the measurements can be, again, fancy measurements, but we'll just take them here to be simple ones, where I just look at the state, read out the state in some basis of all these things. I get a bunch of data from my measurement. I put them into some computer, and then I output from all that uh, an estimate of my parameter I want to measure. Okay, so that's sort of the basic paradigm in quantum metrology. Now, what's different now from classical metrology? After all, at the end, quantum mechanics just allows me to calculate probabilities of these outcomes. So I have a probabilistic model just like I did before. So what's new? Well, there are a couple of new things. First of all, I can prepare initial state. So I have some freedom in how I prepare this, and I can prepare it in a way that, that boosts the information I can I get access to. I also can choose the measurement basis. That's something I don't usually do in classical metrology. And so this gives additional two degrees of freedom that, that we can then use to then unpack, try to get additional information out. Of. Okay. So what's the idea now? <coughs> So if I have a, a state psi, we'll start with just the simplest case of one quantum state. I evolve for some time t under a unitary evolution. Then I'll generate at the end of that process some parameter as a function of time, some state that depends upon that, that uh, parameter g. So what I want to do now is I want to then take the classical information I would get out from measuring this. So I measure. And then I want to maximize that over all basis choice. So I introduce, I call this FG. And when you do that, for pure states, you get a nice simple formula. I'll write it down. I'll call this FQ for quantum. So that's a nice simple formula for a pure state. If you have mixed states, it's much more complicated, so I'm just going to teach you the simple one today. Uh, so that's how if you maximize over all choice of basis, you get this so-called quantum, inform quantum fisher information. Now you can go on and you can also try to maximize over the choice of the initial state. And to do that, I'm going to give a simple model. So I'll write a simple special case, which will help give you an intuitive picture. So I'm going to write a Hamiltonian down. I'm going to write it as the parameter g I want to estimate times some operator a, the termission. 
itself a joint. And so therefore, the unitary operator is very simple. It's just e to the minus i g t a. And then if I plug that formula into this expression I wrote down on the previous chalkboard, I get the following expression. So the answer is just 4t squared, the time times the variance of the operator in the initial state side that I started with. So to maximize the efficient information and therefore minimize my precision, I want to maximize the variance. And the way I do that is if I have an eigen system for this operator A, let's, let's take a discrete spectrum for example, what I want to do then is I'll take this state and write it as an equal superposition of the minimum eigenvalue and the maximum eigenvalue. So if I do that, that will then maximize the variance. And if I put that into this formula, I, find I get my final result here. T squared A max minus A min squared. Okay. So given these setup, that is going to be the maximum information I gain. And so therefore, my, my uncertainty in G is going, to be, uh, is going to be controlled by the inverse of that. Okay. So I can write that the uncertainty in G is bigger than or equal to 1 over t a max minus a min. And again, for uncorrelated probes, this would be square root of n. Okay. So this fact that it goes like 1 over root n, even for quantum systems, this is for independent probes, or, in, num, in, or if, if I had independent probes, I would still get this. This uh, delta g goes like 1 over root n. They call this standard quantum limit, scaling. So if I added in more copies of this, for example, I have many copies, but they are independent of each other, I get this scaling. Okay? On the other hand, if I have something like delta g goes like 1 over t, this was, I got this only because I had coherent evolution between the beginning and the end, so they call this Heisenberg scaling in time. If I have independent samples at different times, it would typically go like 1 over root t or even, even more slowly uh, as I scaling with time. Okay, so this relies on coherence. Okay, so now I've given you some formal results. I want to give you a very, some very simple examples. I'm going to, I'm going to give every, all the next set of phenomena will be given with one example for simplicity, a spin in the magnetic field. So although that sounds very simple, we can easily make it more complicated by adding many spins or making the magnetic field dynamic. Okay, so examples. So the first is historically discovered and called a Ramsey sequence. Okay, so let's switch, a, switch to color chalk now. So I have some magnetic field, B. I have some spin uh, with magnetic moment, mu, in the magnetic field. We'll make it be a spin one half particle for simplicity. And the question is, how do we estimate the value of the magnetic field? Estimate V. Okay, what is it? You can estimate either its magnitude or its direction, whatever you want. And the way this was discovered, and turns out to be a very nice way to do it, is we start with the ground state of the system. So the Hamiltonian minus mu dot V, which I'll write as minus mu zero V uh, sigma z operator, so this is the z direction, like so, we'll use a poly matrix there. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply a pi, pi over 2 pulse. And typically this is done either with an optical or microwave field that comes along and, and interacts it with it for a certain amount of time. And then we're going to wait some time t, 
And that will then result in the precession of this spin around the magnetic field. And it acquires a phase. So we'll write the phase as this mu naught b t. And, and I can understand this phase in a very simple way. If I just have the block sphere like this, and I start, say, along this direction, I simply process around this axis. And this angle here that's subtended is that phase. And that's going to be controlled by the, free, by the magnetic field. So the idea is, and then, so let's finish the, the sequence. So then finally, you apply another pi over 2. And then you measure uh, in z basis. And so what that does is that after it processes for some time, the second pi over 2 brings the state, if it's in this plane, it brings it back to, the, uh, to, to this direction, partially. And then we can then see to what extent it does. It is that by measuring the z, the z vector. And so what you find when you measure that, you find the probability, according to quantum mechanics, of being spin up is cosine squared times the phase, some phase. Probability of being down is sine squared times some phase. And once again, the phase is like the magnetic moment times the field times the time. So if I put that into the classical Fincher information, what I find is that uh, the square root, let's say if I take the phase uncertainty squared, square root, that's the uncertainty, this will be given by 1 over 4 times the number of times I repeat the measurement in. Okay? And if I turn that into magnetic field uncertainty by putting in my relations, so this is like what Mark was asking about, I go from phase to magnetic field, this tells me that my square root uncertainty in magnetic field then is always bigger than, well, let's say, 1 over the magnetic moment times the time divided by square root of 4n. Okay, so the longer I make the time, so this is like what I got before, the longer I make the time, the, the uncertainty decreases, and the longer, the more times I repeat it, the uncertainty decreases as well. So this is more or less standard, uh, uh, this is the simplest example. But now I wanted to go so, do some more, sort of more, slightly more fancy things. So one of the goals of quantum metrology is to try to change the exponents here and there. With even the same resources, can I get more precision? So what are the, some of the ways quantum mechanics can be used to do that? So this is, I'll call this example two. So one of the first things we could do is instead of having a bunch of spins that are independent of each other. So this, if I have a direct product of spin states all prepared in the same direction, okay, so this is called a coherent spin state. I'll, 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 I'll index it with the polar and the azimuthal angles. So this doesn't give me any advantage. This gives me the same scaling that I had over here, just for independent, so they're independent number of particles. Uh, but let me define a, an angular momentum. Of the, of the spin ensemble, I'll write it as a sum over all of the spins, uh, sigma i alpha. Okay. And so the idea now is that rather than considering this state, we're going to consider a different state. So let's look at something like this. e to the minus i. So if I had a Hamiltonian that, for example, it would involve a bilinear interaction. So if the Hamiltonian did something like this, sum over k and l. Sigma k, sigma l. So now the Hamiltonian acts on pairwise operations or pairwise spins. 
it generates a state that looks something like this operating on the state 1 in. So this is a simple example to illustrate what happens. And I can uh, illustrate it on, the, on a picture with a picture. So in the ordinary way of doing it, if I just have the coherent spin state, if this is x, y, z, then I can think about trying to measure the phase, the phase uncertainty, which I can write as delta j, y over j, z. Again, y, z are the spatial directions. Uh, uncertainty, this is the uncertainty in j, y over the uh, uh, magnitude of this. And so I can think about trying to measure, let's get a different color. I can measure the spin to be a certain direction, but then there is uncertainty about where that spin points. And the uncertainty here exactly scales like this 1 over t square root of n. So this is like, the, so the angular uncertainty is like 1 over root n. But with this spin squeeze state, so, we call, so this is we call this a spin squeeze state. Uh, yeah, so squeeze state, spin. Then if I draw the same picture, the idea is that this is x, y, and z at this state, is that you have uh, some squeezing in a certain direction. And so if I move it over by some, the same angle theta, then uh, because I'm, I have squeezing in one direction and not in the other, the fact that it's narrower in this direction gives me finer precision about the phase I want to estimate. And so I can then quantify that. With the following. So here, this uh, uncertainty of phase is then something we'll write it as a parameter zeta r over root n, where this uh, uh, zeta r goes like n to the minus alpha, depending on the model I have. And typically, we have alpha less than or equal to alpha less than a half. So we try to improve the scaling within using this uh, spin squeeze state. OK, this is my second example. Let me give a third example. Example three. So by the way, I've given this example for atomic spin ensembles. But, but the same kind of thing happens also in optical physics as well. You can also generate uh, states that are squeezed in the quadrature space. And you get the same kind of metrological advantage for, for, for optical applications. So in the third example, uh, this is called the, the GHZ state, greenberger horn zeilinger state. Or in the optical context, this is also known as the noon state. OK, and the idea here is I have n spin 1 half particles. I'm not going to write down a Hamiltonian, but suppose I could write down some kind of crazy Hamiltonian that would generate the following state. So I have n particles being in state 0, coherently superimposed. with n particles being in state 1 all over square root 2. So this is this absolutely crazy entangled state where all the spins are up or entangled with all the spins that are down in one state. Okay. Now, why would I write down such a crazy state? Well, you might imagine it's extremely fragile. And indeed, but because it's extremely fragile, it's also extremely sensitive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this state and apply my simple example, but now with n spins. So the Hamiltonian, once the state is generated, will just be the sum over all the poly operators uh, uh, like so. But now it's easy to see if I apply a unitary, right? So e to the minus i h t 
on this state, this will generate a relative phase here. Okay, so then the, so then the, the state then at some time t looks something like this. So the re, I'm always going to write the relative phase. So I get now, instead of just e to the i phi as the relative phase, I get e to the i n times phi. So I'm adding up the resources coherently and no longer incoherently. And so if I work this out now, it's easy to work out what the phase uncertainty squared is. Uh, if I write the square root, so before it was 1 over, remember, 2 root n. Now it's the square root of 4 n squared, because I have now this, this factor of n in the relative phase here. And so it's 1 over 2 n. All right, so we call this uh, Heisenberg scaling in, 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 in space, or in, in par parallel resources. So the punchline at the end of the day is I'm using some feature of quantum mechanics, in this case entanglement, this crazy entangled state, to generate some kind of metrological advantage that's super sensitive to the phase, in this case to say the magnetic field I want to estimate, so I get this advantage. Let me stop here and see if there are questions or comments. All right, so one of the, one of the so this is a crazy exciting thing. But one of the practical roadblocks is when you try to make this, this is extremely susceptible to decoherence. And so in practice, uh, it, it's really, really hard to make these states. And you can only make them for maybe two, three, four in, in, and then it gets really hard after that. I should mention in the optical context, what you want to do is you have a beam splitter like this, and you have some kind of magic beam splitter so that you have n photons in this arm of the interferometer zero photons, photons in this honor of the superimposed with n photons here and zero photons there. So that's why you do it in the optical context. Okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, we've got, we're going to 115, Lars? Yeah, well, five minutes Okay, good. Okay, good, five more minutes, okay. So, so, so this is called Heisenberg scaling. And so you might ask, is this the ultimate limit? Is this the best we can do? It turns out, no, it's not the best we can do. And, I, and because of time, I'm just going to tell you in words rather than write it formulas. So one of the things you can do is you see that to get, for example, this state I wrote down, it involved a two-body interaction. What if you wrote down some Hamiltonian that involved a k-body interaction, and the parameter was sitting outside of that k-body interaction? Well, it turns if you do that, this was shown by uh, Caves and Bronstein and people back in 2007 and later, that you can get the parameter, parameter and certainly goes like 1 over n to the k, where k is the number of k-body interactions uh, of, the, of the model. So this connects then starts to connect with condensed matter physics and be able to do things like that. That involves these nonlinear interactions of k, of k order. And so another question we, we answered maybe a year or two ago with my students is we said, can you have just bilinear interactions but still generate better than Heisenberg? And it turns out you can. But the trick is there, you have very long-lived uh, correlations. If you look at the correlations that go between the two, two different spaces, if the correlation goes down like 1 over the length to, to some exponent, or 1 over like the logarithm of the length to some exponent, then you can get super Heisenberg scaling, with, usually with a logarithm. Uh, so this is in these Kataev chain models, which is, again, a connection to condensed matter physics. Okay. So one of the other fun things I did is, is so this is people usually talk about Heisenberg scaling in position. What about exceeding Heisenberg scaling in time? And uh, so one example of that is if I go back to my magnetic field, suppose I don't want to estimate the value of the magnetic field, but now I start making the magnetic field rotate in time. So the magnetic field looks something like cosine omega t, uh, say z hat, plus sine omega t, x hat. Okay. So you might say, that's a, like a very contrived example, Andrew. Why would you put, give me this crazy example? Well, just last week, I was sitting with the high energy particle physics, and, they, and this guy said, you know, I'm trying to build this dark matter detector, and it relies on measuring magnetic field, but I can't get the sensitivity I need with the pickup coils. And I said, what's your problem? Well, I said, well, the, the dark matter turns out to make the magnetic field rotate really fast in time. You've got to estimate the frequency in a very short amount of time. I said, 
I can solve your problem for you. So, so how does it work? How does it work? So what's fun about this example is it turns out because you have this dynamics, you need to have dynamical solution as well. So you not only sit, wait, and measure, you add some kind of control to the system. And this, this gives a whole new richness to the metrology problem. And the basic idea, what's, what's interesting about it, is that if you have a Hamiltonian, if you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, So now the Hamiltonian itself depends upon time. The point is what you usually want to maximize is you want to maximize things like the eigenvalues of this quantity, but this is an operator, and this operator does not commute with this quantity. So to get the best met metrological precision, you prepare things that are in eigenstates of the parametric derivative of the Hamiltonian, but once I do that, if I don't do anything special, the dynamics takes it off of the right track. So you have to add control to keep it on the track in order to get the best precision. And what's interesting when you do that is you can show, for example, if I want to estimate the magnetic uh, field frequency, estimate this parameter, this parameter turns out to make these states accelerate away from each other in time, and so the Fisher information doesn't go like time squared anymore, it goes like the fourth power of time. Okay, so then that means that you can get a polynomial improvement of the precision of estimating this frequency. And so in fact, Cater Merch, you're here, Cater. You're in the back. Okay, I, I, I showed, I was at the March meeting a few years ago and I sat down and we had a drink over a beer and I said, Cater, this has got this cool idea about metrology. And like in the next week, he went home and did it. He, he, he put it in his uh, superconducting qubits. It turns out you have to apply a certain kind of control we showed this one over t squared scaling in like um, less than a month. So, so we have a nice paper about improving that. And, uh, and so that's the basic uh, idea. All right. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, thanks for your attention. That's right. So all of these Fisher information uh, calculations rely on some kind of model for your system. So you have a model either for the Hamiltonian of an unknown parameter or the probability distribution. What's interesting, there's a new interesting feature here. So I told you you have to apply control to this problem. So what you do is you have basically you have the total Hamiltonian looks like this, but then you add a control term. And what's interesting is that very often you need to approximately know what the parameter is to be able to apply this optimal control. And so then you say, okay, Andrew, you kind of put me in some kind of loop here because I need to know the right, the parameter I'm, I'm trying to estimate to apply the right control. But there's a nice way around this, which is you do some short measurement to get a coarse uh, uh, estimate of what G is. You adapt your value here. So this is an adaptive value. You do it for a longer time. You do it again, and you can prove a very rapid convergence of this iterative procedure to the optimal control strategy. Oh, oh, when they build it with optical systems, they, I mean, they, they have so they usually, they usually they do something like optimal optical parametric down conversion to create biphotons, but then they like keep them in circulating loops and they have them come and collide together on beam splitters at the same time to create some kind of a process. So it's post-selected, so they have to do this like a billion times to get one noon state. Uh, and so this is one of the bottlenecks: is trying to produce these efficiently is really really hard, especially in optical context. Yeah, yeah, good. So, so, so I, I give, I'll just give a, a one minute summary. There, there, so, so I, and I can probably give a whole other lecture about it, but I'm going to get a really quick three examples. So I'll just give you the basic idea. The first example is that one of the interesting things in quantum physics is something called a weak value. This was created by Aronoff and company. 
And the idea is if you pre-select and post-select a quantum state and you have some operator, if you do the pre-selected value, or suppose selected, you get some kind of anomalous shift of a meter that's coupled to the system. And so they suggest maybe you could use this for some kind of metrological thing. And so we have a bunch of papers doing this optically, where you can understand it with electromagnetic theory, but it's just an interference effect. And the idea is you sacrifice a lot of intensity of your light, but you get a much bigger signal on your detector. Okay, so if it turns out that the total fish information is, is the same, but, but you concentrate the information to a much, much smaller number of photons, and so there's all kinds of advantages you can exploit for that. So that's one a quick example. The second example is really came up with Mankai Seng. Is, is Mankai here? I don't, I don't know if he's around. But, but he came up with a really cool idea, which is if you do uh, optical, uh, the, re the Rayleigh limit, so if you have two point sources of light, you can't bring them smaller than the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture of the imaging system and still resolve them. And he had a really cool idea. He said, suppose I put a quantum computer on the end and I could then process the light coming in some fancy way. It turns out you don't need a quantum computer. All you have to do is sort the optical modes. If you have some kind of like hologram or you have a spatial light modulator, and you sort the optical modes into, a, into some set of orthogonal polynomials, you can beat the resolution limit. You, you can measure distances much, much smaller than that limit. Third example, last example, is a paper I published one month ago with my friend John Howell. There is a, there's a classic uh, bound in radio theory, in radar. If you look at all the radar manuals, they say, if I want to find the best limit on radar resolution, I send out some pulse electromagnetic radiation, and I want to say, if there's a Lars here or, or, or there's the wall behind it, what's the, what's the smallest distance you can get between them before you can't distinguish that there are two objects and there's only one object? And in, the, and in all the books, they say if the pulse is uh, the pulse needs to be smaller than the distance between those two people, otherwise you can't do it. We found a way to beat that by orders of magnitude. The way we did it is we send out some pulse of, that we can tailor. We have a reflection off the two objects. There's an interference process, but then you do parameter estimation on the light you get back. You, you measure it on some uh, basically very simple oscilloscope. Uh, and then by looking at the, the form of the, of the composite pulse, we had a way of then teasing out that parameter uh, much, much smaller than this traditional limit. So that's in PRL a month ago, if you want to read about that. So those are, those are three examples of classical, classical metrology, things people have basically overlooked, uh, but by looking at it with fresh eyes, we're able to discover interesting new effects. Thank you, Andrew. Okay.